Greetings. This is the lecture for lesson number 29. It's a bit of a review lesson. Um, it's in BSF entitles this lesson, God's Purposeful Plan Through the Divided Kingdom. It's lesson number 29. Uh, just a couple of, uh, just one real announcement, and that is that while this is the last lesson for the year, uh, we do, our, our year is not over until after we have our sharing night, or sharing nights in this case. We will be having sh sh different sharing nights for the different locations for our, for our class. On May, Monday, May 8th, we will be in person at Valley Community Church, 7 o'clock, and we'll have an in-person sharing there. And we'll encourage you to come out for that if you're part of the Monday class. On Tuesday, the 9th, we'll be in person at um, Contra Costa Gospel Church up in, up in uh, Walnut Creek, but we're going to attempt to do a hybrid sharing there, so we'll be setting up a, a um, Zoom connection for that, and we'll see, try to do the best we can to do a hybrid version of it there. But would really encourage you to come out in person for the sharing there in, at Contra Costa Gospel. And then the Berkeley satellite on Thursdays, that's going to be an entirely virtual uh, sharing uh, on Zoom. And uh, Gary Louie will be putting out the, um, the Zoom invitation for that particular location. And with that, let's uh, bow our heads and prepare our hearts for uh, God's speaking to us as we look back on our, less, on our study for the entire year. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, um, we are so thankful, so thankful that you have uh, carried us through this long, uh, difficult but fruitful lesson. Uh, and we, we thank you for the, the great um, examples, the stories that we've studied, and, uh, and the uh, prophets, the many prophets that we have gone through. And we, while it's for many of us, this has new, been new territory. We pray that, uh, that you will now uh, help us to remember back and cement in our minds the truths that you have for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, life moves on at a rapid pace, doesn't it? We wonder where the time has gone. And of course, the older we get, the faster time seems to pass. And even more recently, people have commented at the rapid pace of change that we find within our society. Time just, just doesn't go by fast, but time and our beliefs and our opinions have changed drastically. We have opinions and beliefs today that would have been laughed at five years ago, and yet they're presented as normal and right and just. And the pace of change and the move away from God has led us uh, to a crisis of purpose in this world. I think that's due to our lack of deliberation. We don't dwell on the past and we don't seek to learn from it and we have lost connection with our ancestors. We no longer seem connected to the people who came before us. We suffer what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. We think, today we think that we are better than our ancestors. As we come to the end of our study of the people of promise, divided kingdom, we wonder where the time went. We need to then pause and reflect on what we've learned. This has been a most unusual study for BSF. I've, I've, I've shared that with you in recent weeks. It's been more of an Old Testament survey as we've flown through the, the history of Israel and Judah. Fifteen different Old Testament books we studied this year. And before we break for the summer, I, it would be good to pause and review the lessons uh, from the divided kingdom once more and try to cement them into our hearts and minds. Throughout our study, we have seen the Israelites. They were God's special and chosen people, and yet they repeatedly rebelled against the Lord. It's what Stephen preached in his sermon before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 6. He recounted how the history of Israel, uh, uh, about the history of Israel and their countless rebellions. And then he put it to the Jewish leaders. He, said, he looked at him and he said, you stiff-necked people, 
with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You were just like your fathers. You were always resisting the Holy Spirit. And then he went on to ask, was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? We know from our study firsthand this year that the answer was no. Even so, God continually reached out to his rebellious people, and he continually reaches out to us today. Remarkably, God was not disgusted by Israel's rebellion. He did not write them off completely. It is his nature to reach out to his created people in love. We think we are the ones that are seeking him, but the reality is he is the one always taking the initiative. And that's the main point of this review, is that we, we have seen it in this study, and many of us have even seen it in our own lives. And now uh, we look at, um, at this whole study in review. And I've organized my lecture in two parts. First of all, we're going to look at God's story through Israel's history. Sin is so ingrained in us that we cannot keep our covenant promises. What we found this year is that we need God's help. And then we'll, again, review uh, some, of the, some more of the key lessons from the divided kingdom in the second half of my lecture. And what we're going to see here is that we always think that th the story is about us. But what we're going to see here is that this world, the events of this world, the story, the Bible, they're all about the Lord. So let's dig into and review in our, this review of our year. As we think back on Israel's story, we realize that it was a dark, dark period of history. In fact, we see that in the very title, Divided Kingdom. Week in and week out from man's perspective, it's been a dismal picture. But we see God's wonderful character shine brightest against man's continued failings. There were some bright spots, but mostly a downward spiral as God's people moved farther and farther from him. And this should not, come, not have come as a surprise to Israel or even to us. Because as a part of the Mosaic Covenant, God made it clear what the consequences would be for disobedience. The reason the kingdom divided it goes back to Solomon's reign. As a young king, Solomon asked God for wisdom. He knew that ruling the nation was more than he could handle. But despite a promising beginning, he, like many, ignored God's warnings. He multiplied his wealth, his power, his wives. And all those wives brought with them their false gods which gradually drew Solomon's heart away from the Lord. We often think that we can manage sin. We can dabble in it and limit its range and impact. We can't. Without God's help, sin ultimately controls us. Solomon's our example. I'm sure he never set out to accumulate 800 wives, but in the end, that's where he, where he found himself. Big problems always start with little sins. Because of Solomon's sin, God chose to divide Israel. Rather, he, he chose to rip 10 of, uh, 10 of the 12 tribes from the house of David. And he used a man named Jeroboam. Uh, the nation split upon Solomon's death. Northern Israel uh, went under Jeroboam's rule and the southern kingdom under Rehoboam, Solomon's son. Over the next few centuries, the two kingdoms experienced spiritual and moral decline. From the start, Jeroboam failed to trust God's promises to him. Through the prophet Ahijah, he was offered a covenant promise directly from God. Instead, he established idolatry as the northern kingdom's state religion. They had a steady parade of evil kings, increasingly evil. Their kings rose and fell through political intrigue and military coups. The southern kingdom had the occasional godly king who would lead the people in a revival. Men like Asa and Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah and Josiah. They stood against idolatry and attempted to lead the people back to God. But the overall trajectory in Judah was the same as the north. Both kingdoms 
permanently rejected, persistently rejected God, even as he was sending his sending promised calamities to dissuade them, famines and droughts and military incursions. Both kingdoms persistently rejected God, even as he was sending them his prophets, calling the people back to him in repentance. In the end, both kingdoms ended up in exile, as promised. This is where our storyline ends. Division instead of unity. Many fail leaders. A citizenry that suffered spiritually and morally, giving into idolatry and evil. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? So what do we learn? What is God's story embedded in Israel's story? Well, while Israel's story pauses in the tragedy of the exile, God's story continues on. As dark as this period was, God was always at work, always advancing his plan. Even man's failures were part of God's plan of redemption through his son. And so there are a number of points to make about the Lord as we look at, look back at Israel's history. First, we see that God is the one who is always taking the initiative. He was the one who was sending his prophets to sinful people. He did not just warn them in the beginning. He continued to reach out to them, reminding of, the, of their covenant relationship and confronting them with the consequences of their choices. The Lord is a calling God. He is, a per, he is persistent in reaching out to rebellious people. And in reaching out to people, he shows his long-suffering and patient nature. His consequences are always tempered by his compassion and grace. He's not punitive. He is always looking to restore our broken relationship with him. And he is doing it as the offended party. We should be reaching out to him, but he reaches out to us. And that's because he understands our weaknesses. He's not shocked by our neediness. He is always offering us hope and help. And this has been his posture toward mankind throughout history. Another lesson we learned this year is uh, concerns our failings to live as God's people. The people of Israel were chosen out of all the peoples of the world, chosen to represent God to the world. And given this great privilege and responsibility, they chose to um, wander into sin and idolatry. They chose to trust human kings and lifeless idols rather than the Lord of the universe. Their record is our record. And it is rather stark to see it in the terms that prophets like Hosea presented, calling it spiritual adultery. The highest and best purpose of any of us is to walk through life in fellowship with our Creator. And the worst tragedy of all is to walk away from our Creator. Because we are made for this purpose, I think this is why we see many people today who are depressed and without purpose in their lives. A third lesson is that God's warnings are not empty. Indeed, he brought judgment on Israel, but only after persistent warnings. We've had a, we have a God who gives us many, many chances. But the lesson of this study is that eventually those chances run out. God judged Israel by what he took away from them. Initially, this was their security and their material support, but ultimately it was their very land. He took away what they wrongly trusted, and he will do the same for us if we trust in idols of our making. But God also judged Israel by giving them at times exactly what they wanted. They experienced the powerlessness of false gods. They wanted human kings and they got bad ones. They wanted material wealth and they got a society that took advantage of one another. The scariest aspect of God's judgment is that it will often be of our own choosing. And then the final lesson that I bring up this, uh, in this lecture, uh, lesson, the final lesson to God's story is I think the best of all. And that is the hope of restoration to come through Christ. Almost every pro prophetic message we studied this year 
included a future hope of God's Redeemer. The kings failed. The people failed. Their kingdoms were destroyed. But God's plan it, it was and is being executed to completion. Jesus Christ came to fulfill all of God's promises. It's just as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, all God's promises are yes in Jesus Christ. And so the principle that I offer to you here in this first half of our review is that man's inevitable failures expose our deep need for God. Let me repeat that. Man's inevitable failures expose our deep need for God. Israel's story reveals man's neediness. They show us the inadequacy of living independent of God. They reveal the inadequacy of human solutions to our problems. God's story reveals his heart for needy people. We are people who often wander in our personal wilderness settings. His story reveals the sufficiency, the necessity of his great salvation. This year's study reveals the importance of knowing the scriptures. Many of us went into this year with the false notion that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. And what we learn is that he is exactly the same from beginning to end. He has intentionally revealed himself through his written word and through his dealings with his people, through the history of Israel. He hasn't changed and neither have we. We are just as needy today as the ancients were. And so I ask you, how have, you, how have your past failures demonstrated your deep need for God? Israel's story revealed their inability to keep the law. They broke covenant with God almost immediately after agreeing to it at Mount Sinai. And they continued to break it throughout the, their history. Israel's story reveals the necessity of God's new covenant in Jesus Christ, a covenant he can keep. And that's God's story, a Lord who is completely faithful to himself and to his people. Now, last week in our study of Habakkuk, I made the statement that Christianity is more than a religion of ideas. And at the time, what I was stressing was the unique aspect of our faith, that it is anchored by the historic facts that God has executed as part of his redemptive plan. Now I would like to reflect on some of the profound ideas that we have learned this year. First, concerning the Lord himself. He is, again, is purposeful in his control of human history. If the world even considers God, they portray him as a watchmaker, as one who created the world and wound it up and then stands back to watch it, uh, watch how things turn out. At best, he is an interested spectator. But what we have learned instead is that the events of history and the world are not a free-for-all. God is not surprised by anything that happens. He does not have to compensate for unexpected events. While we often fail, he always prevails because he is in control. Last week I attended our Berkeley satellite. And we had a great discussion about God and his relationship with evil in the world. The question was, does God cause evil or merely allow it? And it was a great discussion that we had. What we have seen this year in Divided Kingdom is that God's purposes prevail despite the rebellion and sin we commit. In fact, he uses the sinful acts that primarily are against him and weaves our rebellion into the execution of his plan. When we recognize what he is doing, we can only wonder at his infinite wisdom and power to do so. Now, as dark as Israel and Judah's history was, God's sovereignty was on display through every event and every king. His absolute control over human history should settle our hearts as we watch the events, the events unfold around us. God is in control, even as things appear to be out of control. And that was Habakkuk's conclusion at the end of his 
another aspect of God to ponder is his holy and righteous response to our sin. You know, it's easy to, to focus only on the harsh consequences that God imposed on his people. What we fail to reflect on is the necessity of his actions. A holy God must respond to everything that dishonors him. What kind of God would he be if he merely overlooked, his, uh, overlooked sin against him? We forget that every sin is an offense against the Lord. Oftentimes there are human victims as well, and that's where we are likely to focus. But a realization that a holy God sets the constraints for behavior is, I think, the best perspective for us to take. Understanding that God as our creator knows best for all of his creation leads to humility and acceptance of his consequences. That's the right posture to have in judgment. And then there is the remarkable way in which God works. His ways, we found, are surprising to us and infinitely superior. God's actions are rarely the way we would act. Habakkuk didn't foresee God's use of, Bab of the Babylonians. No one would have foreseen God's preservation of Israel through brutal judgment and exile. No one would have foreseen Christ's path to glory through the suffering of the cross in Isaiah 53. The suffering servant song never was anticipated to be literally fulfilled at Calvary. And to this day, the Jews don't know what to do with that chapter. Many simply ignore it because it doesn't fit into their view of God. Our God specializes in acting in ways that often baffle us. But when we later understand what he is doing, his acts become marvelous in our sight. And as surprising as God is, he is especially trustworthy. He's the only one worthy of our trust. Our institutions, our leaders, our investments, they'll all eventually fail us. But because of God's unfailing character and eternal perspective, we can trust him completely. Like Habakkuk, when we encounter troubles, we can trust in the Lord because he is our strength. Now to be clear, we don't understand everything that is happening. And that's why we live by faith. God controls everything. His wisdom surpasses, far surpasses our understanding. This divided kingdom study should have led us to a focus on God. Now let's consider some of the things we learn about humanity in, in general. What we see in the histories of Israel and Judah were the same failings of societies were so, uh, and the tendencies of people that we see today. We saw the failure, their failure to trust God. We find ways to trust everything else but God. The Israelites trusted in flawed kings and political alliances and false gods. And all of these things failed them in the end. Trusting the God of the Bible requires that we know him personally and we wait on him. And it's a marvelous thing to trust in a God who loves us perfectly and is in complete control. There's no more secure place to be than in his hands. And still today, we trust more in our institutions, in our leaders, in our investments. They are no more secure than what we saw in Israel. Still, we seek human solutions that are no solutions at all. We address symptoms rather than the root problems. We attempt inadequate solutions rather than seek God to do what only he can do. God loves us too much to let our misguided attempts succeed. He does so because he created us for the purpose of relating to him. We find our deepest meaning and purpose in him. The people of Israel failed to experience what God intended for them because they failed to seek him. The highest purpose of mankind is to know him and walk with him through this life and eternity. To see virtually all of humanity walking away from the only one who brings life and meaning and richness to our existence, it's heartbreaking. The spiritual bankruptcy of the world is obvious. God is the only hope. 
we have talked ourselves into believing that the world isn't interested in spiritual affairs, and many aren't. But we have a God who is beautiful and wise and powerful and fully sufficient to meet all of our needs. We are needy and he is fully capable. And that's a message that everyone should hear. As we come to a close, let's take a last look at ourselves. What do we learn about ourselves from the divided kingdom? Well, the first thing to say is we are Israelites. It's easy to shake our heads in disgust at their foolishness and their rebellion. We scoff at their repeated sins and their inability to learn from the past. And yet, if we are honest, we often display the same waywardness. We are too prone to wander from the God we love. We too go through periods where we are distant and cold toward the Lord. We too are enticed by the charms of the world. The older I get, the more ways I uncover uh, for straying from the Lord. I still allow the cares of the world to overshadow what is most important. The reality is we exhibit the same rebellious tendencies as the ancient Israelites. We also learned that we are just as idolatrous as the ancients. It's easy to criticize people who crafted figurines from wood and metal and then worship them. While our idols are more sophisticated, they are no less dangerous and no more capable uh, than statues. They are dangerous because they draw our attention and our affections from God. And they are just as incapable of saving us. The people, the government, our stock portfolios, will again, will all ultimately disappoint us in our time of need. Do you know the idols in your life? Just think, what do you fear losing the most? What has a hold on you that you can't shake? It is foolishness to place our trust in anything other than God. If we don't purge the idols out of our lives, God has his ways of dealing with them. Sometimes he does it by taking things away, as I said earlier, our financial security or our jobs or even relationships. He removes them. The, he removes the things that uh, reveal our misplaced loyalties. And then sometimes he lets us have what we desire to help us discover that they could never deliver on their promises. And then we learn that we too need new hearts. The Israelites squandered their privilege as God's chosen people. We risk making the same mistakes. We get too comfortable with God. We no longer fear the loss of his pleasure. Even though we are in Christ, we still have a natural bent towards sin. We risk taking his grace for granted. We sin thinking that we, all we have to do is confess our sins and God will forgive us. We make that calculation in our mind. It's what Brian Chappell calls the mathematics of the mind. That, that we can sin and simply ask forgiveness. We treat God's grace as a get out of jail free card. What we need to overcome the mathematics of the mind is the chemistry of the heart. We need God's help in increasing our love for him and our love to please him more than we love to sin. It is through Christ and his new covenant that we, that our hearts can be changed. The examples of the Israelites and our identification with them helps us realize that God's salvation was the only possible way for us to be reconciled to him. It was the only way he could save us and not contradict his character. Now in our lesson, we were asked to write one sentence summarizing God's message to us in this study. My last principle for the year is my sentence. And that is, it's the, that the Lord is the hero of the Bible, both Old Testament and New. God is faithful even as, even as we are unfaithful. His dogged pursuit of sinners, making a way for us through his son's sacrificial death on the cross, is the greatest heroic effort of all time. Paul writes in 
Romans 5. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's a New Testament quote, but it finds its roots in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 53. Now, forgive me if you've heard me tell this story before, but I think it's, uh, it's I've always found it to be an, uh, uh, instructive. It's been about 15 years now, but I was driving in my car listening to NPR, National Public Radio, years ago. And there was an interview with Carl Sagan's widow. It was a 10 year, it was the 10 year anniversary of his death. And she had published a book of his unpublished writings to correct, commemorate the anniversary of his death. Sagan was Jewish. And the interviewer asked his wife about his spiritual thoughts, what he believed. And she said that her husband considered the God of the Bible to be too small for him to consider. Too small, not, not great enough. I've always wondered what Sagan was reading because the God that we have studied this year is truly magnificent. He is beyond our imaginations in every dimension. And he has the most wonderful character of all. And the contrast between him and us is particularly striking. He is our creator and sustainer. We bear his image and find purpose only from him. He truly is the hero of our story. And so I ask you, how has your view of God changed as a result of the Divided Kingdom study? My prayer is that we end this study more in awe of God than when we started. As hard as our year was, it was a rare opportunity to see the glory of God in stark contrast against our persistent rebellion. Israel's story, permanent, persistent failure is our story. And as, as anxious as we are all for a summer break, I want to challenge all of us to continue to reflect on God's amazing faithfulness. He is the hero of the Bible, and he is our hero as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, um, you are the hero, our hero, for you have saved us and it's all of your doing. Heavenly Father, we see that in the Old Testament. We see our inability in the ancient Israelites and we see all of their sinful tendencies in our own lives. And so we look to you as our hero, as the one who has redeemed us and restored us and renewed us and continued to reach out to us even though we have failed continually. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us in such a fresh and new way through this study. We pray that um, you would keep that our appreciation of you fresh in our minds and hearts forever. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.